In Galatians chapter 5, we'll start reading in verse 13, and this is our main text, and it says, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty, only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Remember, one of the primary ingredients with discipleship was loving one another. And the example is that Jesus said, like, I've loved you. You love each other like I've loved you, okay? And so the title of the message is Understanding and Maintaining Freedom. Understanding and Maintaining Freedom. Today we're just going to talk about the understanding part of it, okay? But it must be maintained, and we'll get into that perhaps a little later. That word liberty there is translated freedom in some other translations, but it means exempt from obligation or liability. You've heard me share that many times many, many times over the years, because that is what freedom is. If there's a sense of obligation, it's not freedom. If we're operating from a place of debt or a place of guilt, that's not God. He satisfied every debt that you have as far as the righteousness. Okay? Everything that needed to be paid for you to be his righteousness is already in place. We don't have to do anything to make that happen. We just simply see it, understand it, accept it, receive it is another way to say that. The Net Bible, I love the way it's worded there because it says, For you were called to freedom. Say, I'm called to freedom. Brothers and sisters, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity to indulge your flesh, but through love, serve one another. Through love, serve one another. That word called there is the word kaleo, kaleo, and it means to call or to bid, but it's to call aloud. The Lord is literally calling us aloud, be free. Come to the freedom of Christ. Man. It's from another word, which means to incite by word, that is order, <laughs> command. You are ordered to be free. It's not really an option or a suggestion. He is ordering us to be free. Well, that sounds like obligation. It's where you want to be, trust me. It's where you want to be. Seems like an oxymoron, but it's not. He wants you to be free. We, we worship and serve him because we're free. We love him because we're free. If we're obligated, we're not free. Okay? Now, back up to verse 1 there in Galatians 5. And this is from the New Living Translation. And it says, So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. Now, do you see where the freedom is aimed at? See, it's very easy to make laws, even for yourself. Okay, there is the law within the scriptures, and certainly Paul is correcting that. But what we're talking about, when we talk about your flesh getting involved, it's back to meriting. That's self-effort. It's not just indulging your flesh. I felt like eaten at the buffet six more times. It's not that. It includes that, but what he's talking about is how we're free in Christ. Amen? Praise God. Now go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Amen. Uh, yeah, this is, um, this is really important. God is so interested in motive. Did you all know that? Why we do things is way more interesting to God, in my opinion, than what we actually do. And I'll give you an example. The Pharisees were pretty outwardly righteous. Yeah, like, they did a lot of stuff right. But Jesus said they were whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. Why? He said, they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Why we do things is so important. And what God is ultimately interested in, does he want fruit out of us? Yeah. But the why 
we do things is way more important than the doing things. And it has to first start with receiving grace and freedom. You know, we can't go down this road of, I got to get busy doing this or I got to do this. You know, yes, thank you. <laughs> no, it's good. I was wishing you would do that secretly. <laughs> um, you know, he cares about why we do things, right? If we find ourselves, here's a good test. If you find yourself feeling like, man, things are just kind of dry and kind of dead and I'm doing all the right things, check your motive. Why are you doing them, right? You guys heard the term sabbatical? There's a good reason to, to take a sabbatical because you've gotten back into law. I need to go back and receive. I'll give you an example. In Hosea chapter 2, one of my favorite stories, God is giving this example where uh, there's this undeserving bride, right? And he, <laughs> I feel so bad for these kids. He has these kids named like, I'm not your God, you're not my people, and I should kill you basically, <laughs> Right? And at the end of it, he's basically pronouncing this judgment, and he's saying, you know, you guys are doing all this stuff wrong. And he says, but I'm going to take you into the wilderness and allure you with my goodness. Right? Sometimes we need to stop and get back to the fact that, we, you know, it, it says this in Colossians, how you received Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in him. How did you receive him? Freely. You believed. You received his love. That's it right? And that's why this verse is saying, don't go back to feeling like you have to merit. It's so interesting. If you ask people, you know, what do you got to be careful as a, of as a Christian? What's the first thing you think everybody says? Sin. Don't sin. Oh, I love to burst that bubble. We all sin constantly. Because you, know you know what sin means? It's the Greek word hamartia. It means to miss the mark. What's the mark? Jesus. To exist is to sin. <laughs> okay? The reality is we have a risk and a warning here. Don't go back to meriting things. We need to stay in the place of receiving. Because out of that comes true fruit. Fruit born out of pure motive, which is free, willing, love, and obedience. Amen? Amen. Amen. And, and he was very clear that the freedom that he's talking about is being free from the law. That's right. And again, we can make our own laws. I've done it. We've all done it. Okay? Yeah. Now, we, we just finished a couple of weeks on discipleship. And, and sometimes I'll go back as I'm post-producing and listen as though I don't know anything about, because I know what I mean, but did I say it correctly? And sometimes you think you've communicated correctly. What I didn't want anybody to hear is an obligation to discipleship. It's an opportunity. If we're following Jesus, if, if we're walking in his footsteps, where his foot just made a mark, I'm right there behind him. If I'm doing that, I'm on course. That was worth coming today. If you're following Jesus, you're on course. You don't have to know every jot and tittle about the plan of God for you. You just need to know where he's going or who you're following, really. Amen? Because I'm the guy I like to know. I'm 10 chess moves out, right? And he doesn't share all that stuff. There's a lot of times I, I don't get to know. I just need to know who I'm following, and that's all I need to do. That's really the biggest part of discipleship. So this dovetails with that. But you're there in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Look at verse 17, and this is the one I texted you yesterday. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty or freedom. There is exemption from obligation and liability. Are you born again? Then freedom is present with you, in you, okay? You, you can, thank you. Thank you, Pastor John. You can, it's like the door of the jail is open, but some people stay inside. 
they have those little um, shock collars, like you make an invisible fence for your animals, and you give them that little collar, and as they get close to the edge, it, it, it shocks them. And so they learn to stay inside the boundary. And then you can actually take the collar away, and they'll stay within that boundary. That's what the enemy has tried to do to us through religion is keep us fenced in. The prison doors are open. You are free. You're free to go. Right? Man, you're in a much better condition than you have any idea. But it must be realized. That's why we want to understand what freedom is. And then it goes on to say, but we all, say that's me, with unveiled face. This is a New Testament condition. With unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. That word glory there is the word doxa, D-O-X-A, and it primarily signifies opinion. Opinion. I always thought it was his, his manifest presence, and that certainly has an application, but this primarily signifies an opinion. We're looking into the mirror, which is the Word of God, and we're beholding, seeing his opinion. What do you see when you look in the mirror? You see your reflection, right? Do you realize, Sean, you've never actually seen your physical face? You've only seen a reflection of it. And you learn to trust the reflection of it. You don't go by how you feel. We're going to watch a video where he talks about that, right? See, I feel like my, my hair is looking good today. But I need to go check the mirror. You know, I may have a straggler that every once in a while I miss one for a couple of weeks, and that's bad. <laughs> Julie will try to pull it. Hey, 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 you know, I don't have many. Leave it, you know. Anyway, sorry, that's a real distraction from what I was trying to say. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed, metamorpho, into the same image, what we behold in the reflection, from opinion to opinion, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So the freedom is realized, it's installed by the Holy Spirit, and then it's realized by the Holy Spirit as we look into the Word of God. Remember, the other primary ingredient to discipleship is continuing in His Word. That's how we follow Him. For me, that's the number one way I fellowship with the Lord is in His Word. Now, I may not have my Bible in front of me because a lot of times I'm just listening to teaching while I'm driving, but I am fellowshipping with the Lord around His Word even though there's somebody talking. I hear God that way. That's the number one way. There's times where you turn all that off and you're just quiet. But the majority of the time, I'm listening to the Word. I'm listening to teaching. Not just Bible verses, but it rightly, being rightly divided. Amen? Now, did you share something? And then we're gonna... Okay, well, we've got a video. It's about 10 minutes long. It's Andrew Womack. That's who I uh, graduated, Karis Bible College. And the, the original video is about... 19 minutes long. I've shortened it way down. It's just a hair over 10 minutes, but oh my gosh, get this. Hello, this is Andrew Womack, and I'm going to be talking about uh, spirit, soul, and body. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that is so obvious. We are made up of a spirit, soul, and body. And the body is very obvious. If you go look in a mirror, that's the part that you see. Now you would be speaking to my soul, which is my mental, emotional part, your mind, will, and emotion. Uh, I believe it's what most people call their personality. If I was to touch your physical body, you can feel that. But I can also touch you by words, and it can touch your emotions. It can either make you glad or sad. It can make you angry. Uh, you can say words and hurt a person. So the body and the soul are two areas that every one of us are in touch with constantly. 
But the spirit part of us is a totally different matter. Jesus said this in John chapter 3 when he says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And there is no direct connection between the two. You cannot, in a physical, natural way, feel your spirit. The spirit cannot be accessed in any natural way, and herein lies one of the great problems in the Christian life. The spirit is the part of us that God communicates with, and the spirit is the part of us that all of the life and the power of God flows through. One of the greatest keys to walking with the Lord for me has been to understand this reality of spirit, soul, and body, that the spirit realm cannot be seen or felt. The only way to discern what is spiritual truth is through the Bible, to just take it and believe it. And if you want to know what your spirit is like, then you have to go to God's Word to find it out. You can't just go by an emotion, by some type of perception. You have to go to God's Word. Sure, in James chapter 1, and in verse 23, it says, For if any be a hearer of the Word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. This is talking about a mirror. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty, talking about God's word, specifically the revelation of the gospel, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. This passage of scripture is likening the Bible unto a mirror that you look in to see your spiritual face, to see what you are in the Spirit. You, with your eyes, have never looked directly into your face. You've always looked at a reflection or a representation, but you've gotten to where you trust that. Well, the Word of God is a perfect reflection of what spiritual truth is. You can't sit there and say, well, I think that, you know, all my mascara is on and that my face is fixed, my hair is combed, I'm ready to go. You can't go by how you feel. You have to go look in that mirror and then you trust what you see. Well, it's the same thing with the Word of God. The Word of God gives you a perfect picture of who you are in your spirit. And it's the only way. There is a total transformation that has taken place on the inside of every person who becomes born again. Now, you can see this in many places, but in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, the scripture there says, If any person is in Christ, they are a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And the next verse says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us unto God by himself. The Lord has totally changed you. It says, old things have, past tense, passed away, all things, present tense, reality, right now, have become new. And all things are of God. Now, if you don't understand this concept of spirit, soul, and body, you are instantly setting yourself up for confusion and frustration and ultimately unbelief. Because you can tell by process of elimination that this is not talking about your physical body. If you were fat before you got saved, you'll still be fat after you get saved. Your body didn't instantly pass away and all things become new. And your soul is also not the part of you that got saved. If you didn't know math before you got saved, you just don't instantly know math after you get saved. The soul is not changed. So by process of elimination, you can say it's not your body and it's not your soul. And so that leaves your spirit. Your spirit is a part of you that got totally changed at salvation. When a person makes Jesus Christ their Lord, there is instantaneous change that takes place. And yet that scripture in 2 Corinthians 5.17 says it isn't in process, but it's already done. It's an accomplished fact, a done deal. And if you don't understand that that change takes place in the spirit and has to work its way out into the soul and the body, then you are going to instantly come into unbelief 
and begin to say, but it didn't change. I'm still the same. And it may cause some people to seriously doubt whether they were ever saved, but your spirit is right now as perfect, as mature, as complete as Jesus is. But when you get born again, your spirit gets elevated. It gets recreated to where it's literally, the Bible says in Galatians chapter 4, that God sends forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. It's literally, when you get born again, your spirit passes away. The old spirit is taken out. It dies, is what the scripture says in Romans chapter 6. And God places within you the spirit of his son. That's what it says again in Romans chapter 8, verse 9. It says, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. In other words, you aren't truly born again unless you receive God putting the spirit of his son in your heart. The spirit of Jesus has come to live inside of every born again person. And your spirit and the spirit of Jesus have intermarried. They've merged. They've become one so that you are now a totally brand new person. And the identity and the holiness, the makeup of your spirit is identical to Jesus. John 4, 24, Jesus said this. He said, God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. He said, you must worship him in spirit and in truth. So how can holy God fellowship with unholy man? Even at our very best, we still fall short of God's standards. Well, the way it happens is, is that when you put faith in Jesus, you become born again, and in your spirit, you become a brand new creature that is righteous and holy. You are as pure and holy in your spirit as Jesus is because it's his righteousness that has been given unto you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, it says that Jesus is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Jesus has become our righteousness. And then as you get your soul in agreement with what is already transpired in your spirit, then you see the physical benefit. Your spirit has to flow through your soul to get into your body, into the physical world. The soul has a valve on it. And basically that is the function of your mind, your mental, emotional part, the soulish part of you. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead already indwells every born-again believer. But if your mind is like a valve, and if it's closed to that, if it doesn't embrace that truth and renew its mind and get to where what you see in the Word of God, in the spiritual mirror, if that doesn't become more real to you than what you see in your physical mirror, then it's possible for this resurrection life that's in your spirit to be completely shut off, just like you would shut the valve on a faucet. And you say, but I feel sick. My body hurts. The doctor says I'm dying. Here's my medical record. And if those things dominate you, that soul can shut off that power so that not one drop of God's life-giving power ever touches your physical body. And you can die sick having the resurrection life of God on the inside of you. And of course, you can apply that to every area of your life. You can have depression in you. You can have uh, anger and bitterness when the whole time in your spirit there is love, joy, and peace, as it says in Galatians 5.22. So the critical part of you is actually the soul. And the rest of the Christian life is renewing of the mind and as we do that, then the physical body will experience the benefit. You hear what God is saying, right? Now, I want you to go over to uh, John chapter 14. Wasn't that good? And like I said, I, I crunched it down. I probably cut a third of it out of it, but that's the meat of it uh, for what we need. But in John 14... We're going to start reading in verse 26. It says, but the helper, Jesus is speaking, but the helper, the King James calls him comforter. I like that. The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Where does that happen? 
in our soul. We get into fear in our soul, but the perfect peace of Jesus Christ is in you, already there. Amen? Now that word comforter or helper is the word parakletos, parakletos, and that's the adjective. The noun is parakalesis, and it's a calling to one side. Para means beside. Kaleo, which we looked at already, means called, right? We're called to live in freedom. And then it says it combines encouragement with alleviation of grief. That's the kind of help we're talking about. Isn't that amazing? He's there to encourage us and to get us separated from grief. Praise God. Now, go over to Romans chapter 8. Isn't that simple? The whole time we're watching that video, I'm just like, thank you, God, for your word. Honestly, like this is so simple. And it, I was just thinking back to the first time I was starting to understand these realities. We can't lose sight of the fact of just what we have. This is so good, right? But I wanted to kind of go back to that, um, the liberty part. You know, any time I think in my walk, I've gotten to the point where this, I'm not as susceptible to this anymore, but guilt should, be a ne- should never be an element of our walk with God, right? Guilt, obligation, shame, you know what I mean? Like, anybody ever felt that where it's like, I feel like I'm doing all the things I know to do with God, but I just feel bad, right? <laughs> That's because the message has been tainted. This is the message that we've been called to liberty. And what is liberty, right? I, w- I just imagine my kid comes up to me and, you know, let's use Titus as an example. And he actually does this a lot. He goes, Daddy, I don't know what to do, <laughs> right? He doesn't know what to do. He's bored. Now, imagine if I said to him, you better do exactly this and then exactly that. And then it. that's bondage. That's fear. That's obligation. You want to say to him, what do you want to do? Right? That's God's posture towards us. When we belong to Jesus, it's not this tight gripped, angry, threatening tightrope we got to walk on. It's welcome. What do you want to do? You know? Because, again, like I was saying earlier, where He really wants us is I'm not doing things, I'm not serving Him out of fear. I'm serving him because I love him. You know, we talked about that on Thursday, right? Which was a great conversation. If y'all weren't there, I'm going to make you, I'm going to add some guilt. You missed it. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Um, No, it was just amazing. It was really, I left so full. But, you know, we were talking about loving total strangers. How do you do that? You receive. And now I love people and I give to people that I don't even know because I want to, because it's fun, and because I know it's like I get to hug Jesus, you know, whatever you've done unto one of the least of these, you've done unto him, right, and that's the place to live from is just this living in a green light of love where it's overflowing out of you, and I don't have to try, I want to, and I get to, and I choose to, and then here's the wild part, he rewards me, how wild is that? What a beautiful system he set up where he changes us and then we do things that we want to do to serve him and love him and then he rewards us for what he put in our heart. How good is God? How good is God? This is awesome. If you guys aren't excited, I'm going to pinch you. (laughs) Amen. I I know I told you to go to Romans 8. I'm going to give you that as a homework assignment. Romans 8, verse 19 through 21. But go over to 2 Corinthians 5. And this was in the video, and I'm going to kind of conclude with this. I, I said we would endeavor to be brief, and I'm going to keep my word. Thank you, Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we'll start reading in verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Does that make sense to you now? (laughs) 
I like what he said. If you were fat before you got born again, you're still fat. Anyway. <laughs> the old has passed away. Past tense. That's past tense. The new has come. I like that present tense. Verse 18, all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. We talked about that in discipleship. So again, he's put a deposit in us that he wants us to give away. And the, the thing is, I'm not obligated to do it. The closer I get to him, the more I want to do it. I'm compelled by the love of Christ. Amen? Verse 19, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. That is the message. The gospel is, sin has been taken care of. I know so many people, we got to get sin out of the church. Jesus did that. It, it's a non-issue. You know, Paul dealt with that. Should we send that grace would much more abound? His answer was, God forbid. Certainly not, right? So we're not talking, some people will say this, the grace message, it gets criticized like we're giving people a license to sin. No, we need to realize it's a dead issue. I still have a flesh, which is selfish, right? But I have this new man on the inside which wants the power and life of God to flow through me. That's what it's talking about when it says, work out your salvation. I used to read that and think, you figure it out. No, that's not what he's saying. Work that out, right? No, he's, it's what's in us needs to be worked out of us. And, and that process is the renewing of the mind. We'll get into that much, much more. Verse 20, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We are righteous because of him. We, we are in his righteousness. That's what changed in our spirit. You're now righteous and holy. I can't tell you how many times I hear guys talking about, got to be holy, got to be holy, right? It, we are holy. Be holy, for I'm holy. He, he's, when he says be holy, he, he's saying live in that, not work on that. Live in that, like the girl that was healed. Remember the woman with the issue of blood? Be healed of your affliction. She was already healed. Your faith has made you whole. Be healed. She's already healed. So she doesn't have to work on getting healed. She's already healed. We don't have to work on being holy except to get it in our thinking. Amen? Praise God. Do you have a comment? I do. I want a piece of that. Roman, or excuse me, John 15. I am the vine, you are the branches right? He is the root of Jesse, okay? I'm establishing some terminology. He's the root. We are the offshoot. In Romans 11 says, if the root is holy, then the branch is holy. It ain't about what we do. We have been made holy. We were created holy. You know, it's, it even says that, I believe in Thessalonians, that we were created in holiness, that doesn't mean we went in a holiness chamber. It doesn't mean that we were made holy because we did a bunch. No. We, what does holy mean? Anybody know? Bingo. It means separated for the purpose and design of God. Come among them and be separate. Right? Have a different purpose. Have a different aim. Have a different design. Holiness is about what we're aimed at. Jesus has designed us to be aimed at the things of God. We are holy. We are set aside and separate for a purpose. Now, do we have to, like Pastor Wade's saying, we have to get that up here. We got to get that in our thinking. But just like everything else, what is true in our spirit 
takes time to become true outwardly. And see, this is the major flaw you see in a lot of other, whatever, denominations or belief systems. They're so carnal. They don't see holiness with their eyes, so it must not be. Well, guess what? We don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. And we're also told in this same area in Corinthians that we used to know Jesus according to the flesh, but we don't know him that way any longer. We know him according to the spirit. We're called to to operate the same way with each other. We're supposed to view each other spiritually. So when I hear things like that, we need to get sent out of the church, what are you looking at? Those are carnal eyes looking at people's carnality. That's not where my focus is. Who's that person in the spirit? Now it's my job to unearth the holiness that is in them already, right? Because it's in there. It's in there. It's in all of us. And so we have to stop walking in this condemnation. We're, we're free. And anytime somebody tries to saddle me with it, I treat it the same as if they tried to just come up and hang a snake on my neck. No way, no thank you. <laughs> Take that somewhere else. For me, it'd be more dramatic. It's like if they tried to dangle a spider on my shoulder. We're not friends anymore, (laughs) okay? But we can't receive the wrong message. And this is something, we were talking about this before service. This is why it's so important that we're around each other, is we need to keep telling each other this message, right? We need to constantly be reinforcing the gospel, because how many of you know we drift? We drift. Life hits us, and you, you're off course. And thank God he sent each other. We're all together in this to get us back on the truth that we are called to liberty. Amen? Amen. Amen. Grace doesn't allow us to sin. Grace frees us from it. Not free to sin. I'm free from sin. Do you see the difference? That's what grace is. Gives me the power to walk right behind him, sin free. I am sin free in my spirit. Amen. Now, our, our opening scripture from the Net Bible, we'll, I'll read it to you and then we'll uh, take communion. Galatians 5.13, for you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity to indulge your flesh, but through love serve one another. And we know that the freedom we're talking about, he said in verse 1, we're free from the law. Don't go back and be a slave. If we add law to our lives, we enslave ourselves. But you're free. Amen? Praise God. Did you get anything out of that? Did that help anybody? Praise God.